Oh, yes, Lord, we do praise you, Lord, and thank you so much for your incredible grace to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Kings. We're picking up with chapter 7. And as we have been doing, we're um, going through the entire Bible in two years. Um, and so we're kind of counting on people to have read that. We have the calendars over on the, uh, over on the table over there if you'd like to see it and, um, and follow a, along as we, and read along as we go through. So what I do is kind of summarize what takes place in the chapters and then make application of that. And the section we have today, verse or chapters 7 through 12 of 1 Kings, there's a lot in there and a lot for us to uh, really take to heart. Um, Solomon had just really finished the, the temple. Now in uh, chapter 7, he spends... 13 years building his house. The house was 25,000 square feet. And that's even a lot for my Roomba. You know, get through. And in verses 2 through 7, Solomon builds a house in the forest of Lebanon. And then in verses 8 through 12, he builds a house for the daughter of Pharaoh, whom he married as part of a treaty with the Pharaoh. And then we're introduced in verses 13 through 14 to Hiram, who is a craftsman. As it says here, it says, Now the king Solomon sent and brought Hiram or, um, from Tyre. He was a son of a widow from the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre a bronze worker. He was filled with wisdom and understanding and skill in the working with all kinds of bronze work. So he came to King Solomon and did all of his work. So he came to uh, cast the uh, mainly all of the things in the temple that were going to be made of bronze, the pillars, which we'll get to in, in a few minutes. Um, they actually took them. There was, in the plain of the Jordan, there was an area of clay there. They would mold things out of the clay and then pour the molten uh, bronze in there and let it cool and then get it out and stand it up. Probably polish it off before there as well, but... So he does cast those two pillars it talks about in verses 15 through 22. Hiram builds the, all the other articles of bronze, the sea, the oxen, the laver, the lavers that are on the carts. And um, Sue, so if you have that picture, here we go. Uh, that's a obviously a kind of con computer generated picture of Solomon's temple. So you see all of these brownish things. Those were all the articles made of bronze. That's called the sea there. Obviously the altar is bronze. And these are what are referred to as lavers. Lavers where the priest would wash as they go in to do service. When I was looking at the uh, pictures of the things that, that the Temple Institute in Jerusalem that they've re, been remaking, um, they have, their labors are different. They almost look like big coffee urns because they have, they have spigots on them. So it's a little, it's a little different, but same purpose. Um, now, by way of application, 
you know, we, you wonder about, you, of course we ask questions about Solomon and all of his wealth and what he did with his wealth. And really, like a lot of people, wealth was a major test to him. You know, what are you going to do with this wealth? It isn't wrong to have several houses and possessions, but the question is for the person where are your priorities? Where are your heart? Where's your heart in the matter? Not the number of things you have. As it says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. In other words, the things that you need will be added to you. What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what are you going to wear? The rich young ruler's problem wasn't that he had many possessions, but those possessions had him. And so that's why he walked away from the Lord sorrowful when Jesus told him to sell all his possessions, give to the poor, and come and follow me. He, Jesus knew what was in his heart, and so he was speaking to his heart, his situation in the matter. He didn't tell, every, he didn't tell Nic Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea to go sell all their stuff. He knew what was the issue in the rich young ruler's heart. Now, in Philippians 4, 10 through 13, Paul writes, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though... You surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, you know, really that's the biblical perspective on wealth. It, the scripture says if, you know, if riches increase, don't set your heart on them. You know, keep your heart focused on the Lord and what he would have you to do in this. Now about those bronze pillars. One was named Jachian, and the other was Boaz. Jachin means he shall establish. And Boaz means it is or he is the strength. You see, the people, and you know, we, we get these repeated pictures in the tabernacle here, or excuse me, in the temple where you know, God is teaching them very important lessons in it. God was to be their strength. They were to be established in him. That's why he told Zerubbabel in Zechariah 4, 6, as it says, and so he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts to do what he does by the Spirit. And, of course, then he was talking about after this temple was destroyed to when they were rebuilding the second temple. So, with those pillars there, it shows the king, the kings, that they are ruling by the grace of God and their they are to then extend the grace of God to the people. And we'll see an issue with that later when we come to Rehoboam. Now in chapter eight, we get to the part of the dedication of the temple. All the work's been completed. Everything's set up, but one thing they haven't done yet. They haven't brought the Ark of the Covenant in. They haven't dedicated the temple. They haven't inaugurated the temple. So first we see, just to summarize quickly, in the first 14 verses, we get a description 
of the ark being brought into the temple and how it gets, as they do, it's brought in from the tabernacle that David had erected in Jerusalem. It would have still been there through the early days of Solomon. And then when the temple was prepared at this day, they bring it into the, they bring the ark. As it says in verse five, also King Solomon, all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted or number for multitude. Then the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary, the holy of holies, of the temple, the most holy place, under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their two wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. The poles extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen in the, or from the holy place. The holy place was there where the uh, table of showbread was, the menorah was there, the altar of incense was out there on the other side of the curtain uh, in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside and they are there to this day. Nothing was in the ark, interesting at this point, nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb. The jar of manna was gone and Aaron's rod was gone. We have no record of what happened to him. Was it when, remember when the ark was taken by the Philistines and, you know, they were plagued because of it. When they brought it back out, some of the children of Israel opened the ark and were struck by a plague. Did they take them out? Don't know. We're not giving that, giving that information. That's sort of the only incident that we know of where it could have been possible. Um, then he said, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel, when they came out of the land of Egypt, and it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. The glory of Yahweh filled the house of Yahweh. So, interesting picture. This, as we'll see, as we'll hear some about when when uh, Solomon gives his dedication speech, he kind of says, Who, what is this building anyway? And that's true. This, that building was just stone, brick and stone, bronze, silver and gold. It wasn't until the ark was brought in and the presence of the Lord came into the temple that it became a temple. It's like, you know, we often refer to a building as a church. It's not. The building is the people. And even before that, what makes a church a church is the fact that the people in that building have been, have come to know the Lord and the Holy Spirit comes and resides in them which makes them the church. So the church is the people, not the building. And you can't call when what really we call the church is the assembly of the people together who have the spirit of God. So 
So, in verses 15 through 21, he gives his dedication prayer, and, or excuse me, dedication speech, and then 22 through 53, he gives his dedication prayer, and then in 54 through 61, he gives a dedication blessing both to the Lord and to the people. And then he holds a feast of dedication in verses um, 62 through 66. But kind of going back to that understanding of the presence of the Lord and the necessity, you know, that's why it's not enough for people just to become religious or to just go through the motions or the rituals, as it says in Romans 8, 9. But you are not of the flesh, You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. That's why Jesus said in John chapter three, you must be born again. Literally can be also translated born from above. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, repenting of your sins, he then sends his Holy Spirit to dwell in you. And that's what Paul was talking about there. But the question for us, though, is do we know the presence of God in our lives? It says we have the Holy Spirit abiding in us. Do we know it? Are we different because of it? Are we allowing him to do the work that he desires to do in us? As we've shared before, the scripture talks about three relationships you can have with the Holy Spirit. You can have the Holy Spirit with you from the Gospel of John tells us. You can have it with you before you a believer. You can have him with you. When you receive Christ, he then comes in you. And then as Acts 1.8 tells us, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So there's three types of relationships, but the expectation is that we should know and experience the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. As it says in Matthew 18.20, he's talking about... uh, actually church discipline here, but, but it applies as well as a general statement as it says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. God demonstrated his approval of this temple by his presence in the cloud. In His letters to the seven churches and Jesus' letters to the seven churches, God's presence was demonstrated in the church, in the churches by the lampstand, the presence of his spirit. Even saying, you know, if to one church in particular, if they don't continue or if they don't repent, he'll remove his lampstand, meaning that he'll remove his presence from that church. That's a scary thought. In Solomon's speech, at the, the first speech here, he, he stressed that God keeps his promises. As it says in Psalm 138.2, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. He keeps his promises. In Solomon's prayer, he prayed the promises of God, the promises that God had made that culminate all ultimately, as he talks about in, here in chapter 8, verse 25, that he'll always have a seed upon the throne, which will ultimately come, culminate 
in the return of Christ. So then Solomon blesses the people based upon God's promises and they're obedient, a conditional promise on their obedience to him, to his law. And it's interesting here, the last statement towards the end of verse, or chapter 8, here as it says in verse 66, on the eighth day he sent the people away. So they had an eight-day feast for the dedication of the temple and they blessed the king and went to their tents joyful and glad of heart for the good, for all the good that the Lord had done for his servant David. That's interesting. David's already dead. But he's fulfilling his promises to, to David. And he says also, and for Israel, his people, fulfilling his promises. We have to realize, we have to know, we have to be convinced that God keeps his promises. As Solomon here, he knew the promises of God that were made to his father. He prayed the promises of God. And then he blessed the people in reference to the promises of God. And really, when we talk about knowing the presence of God as well, that's one way to do it. As we see and we walk in his promises and expect him to keep his promises. As we then walk in the spirit in doing that. Now, in chapter 9, God confirms, first of all, his covenant with Solomon in this second vision that he has in verses 1 through 9. And then Solomon and Hiram exchange gifts, and we'll get to the details of this in a minute. And then we get a list of Solomon's further achievements in verses 15 through 28. But God speaks to um, Solomon after all his great achievements, after he's built all of these houses, as he's, after he's built the temple, obviously, after he's accomplished all of these things. But it seems that Solomon was, has been caught up in the momentum of building. But God speaks to him now after the end of all that when he's alone. And the purpose of his appearing to him is really to warn him, to give him a warning. As it says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. You see, the promises given to Solomon, given to David, are conditional promises, conditioned on their obedience to the Lord. Solomon began even here in this chapter um, even in this chapter by compromising doing things contrary to the purposes, the will and purposes of God. What am I referring to? He gave 20 cities to Hiram. What's he doing giving God's land to somebody else? God's purposes were for his people to have this land. So why did he do such a negotiation? And, and Hiram didn't like him in the, 
even after that, he said, what are these little cities? What are these little places? They're, they're kind of referred to them as a worthless property. He also allowed various Canaanite peoples to stay in the land, using them as forced labor. They were stronger than all of these Canaanites. Now, wouldn't, why didn't they just show them to the border? Okay, guys, it's moving day, you know, and take them out. But they didn't. They kept all of these people there. You think, well, we, have them. we need forced laborers to build all this stuff. A compromise. Do you really? As um, Hudson Taylor, the famous missionary, said, God's will done in God's way will never lack God's supply. But we see this, and we will see this again with Rehoboam coming after the, this. It's how often we try you know, we think we know what God wants, and maybe we do, but, when then, but then we start to think, well, how is this going to get done? And sometimes what we do are little compromises to accomplish these things that God didn't need. And we're really causing ourselves problems in doing that. I mean, these people... The Canaanites were a continual thorn in the flesh to Israel. And really, part of the cause for them slipping into idolatry. Now in chapter 10, we have the Queen of Sheba. Comes in and praises Solomon. She comes to show her admiration for him in verses 1 through 13. And then the rest of the chapter goes into the wealth of Solomon. But the Queen of Sheba, we believe, either came from modern day Yemen or Ethiopia. She didn't believe all the information, all the stories she heard about Solomon and his wisdom. So she wanted to come and see for herself what it was. And after seeing it all, she said, well, the half wasn't told me about your wisdom and your riches. Think about it. It kind of reminds me of, you know, when we get to heaven, when we get into the presence of the Lord, we can say, well, the one millionth wasn't told to me of the glory that's going to be revealed at that time. And it's interesting. It, he then goes in to talking about the amount, his amount of wealth. And he lists the amount of gold there that they acquired yearly was 666 talents. Now, that's an interesting number to show up coming every year. Not exactly sure why, but this doesn't really sound like a coincidence. There's some issues here. And then we see in verse 23 of 1 Kings 10 that it states there, so Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And the question is, is there beginning to become a switch here? Is his focus more on wealth than wisdom at this point? Because Solomon began to accumulate all the things that the kings were forbidden to do in um, Deuteronomy chapter 17, beginning with verse 14. There weren't to multiply horses, chariots, wives, 
silver, gold. They weren't to accumulate all these things for themselves. But we see that Solomon did all of these things. And it's amazing when we speak of the wisdom of Solomon and how wise he was and how he, you know, we, early on we saw that decision he made with the two harlots in relation to their babies. And you think, wow, he was really smart. Yeah, but if you've received a gift from the Lord, you can't just exercise it on your own. Spiritual gifts are exercised in relationship with the Lord, not apart from the Lord. And so when you begin to make decisions contrary to the will and the purposes of God, he was unable to apply wisdom. So we see the gradual turning of Solomon's heart from the Lord. It's like a slow fade here. Now in chapter 11, Solomon pretty much fully turns his heart from the Lord in verses 1 through 13 because of his many wives. 700 wives and 300 concubines. So God raises up adversaries against Solomon in verses 14 through 25. And then Jeroboam, who we'll talk about in a minute as well, he rebels against Solomon in verses 26 through 40. And then at the end of this chapter, Solomon dies. But Solomon seemed to be becoming more and more excited about things rather than having a close relationship with the Lord. The things that he has, having the best of everything, having the most of everything. He was looking for satisfaction in, yes, the things that he possessed, but you we see with 700 wives and 300 concubines, he's also looking for satisfaction in relationships. But it's kind of like the woman at the well in John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. It says, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. You see the woman at the well, she was looking at, looking for meaning for purpose in relationships. She'd been married five times and the guy she was living with now wasn't her husband, Jesus told her. And you could hang that over that as a plaque over anything apart from relationship with the Lord that you look to. If you drink of this well, of this water, you're going to thirst again. It won't fully satisfy. God's intent has always been one man and one woman in a marital relationship for life. These days, again, we have to add one biological male and one biological female. If a man won't be satisfied with the wife God has given him, he won't be satisfied no matter how many wives he has. Solomon, it says, loved many women and loved foreign women in direct obedience, disobedience to the command of God not to intermarry with the nations around him from Exodus chapter 34, verse 16. 
So again, further disobedience, just adding disobedience on top of disobedience. And these women turn Solomon's heart away from the Lord to idolatry as pretty much each one of them says, oh, I need a temple to my God. And so he's building pagan temples even in the area of Jerusalem. Now you might say, well, David sinned, but there's a difference here. David sinned against God, but he never changed God. By falling into idolatry or anything like that, the sins he did, he did to his God in relationship with his God, Yahweh. But he never abandoned God himself. When idolatry is allowed, it's difficult and costly to free oneself or one's nation from that. There are serious consequences. You see, the security of a nation comes from having a real relationship with the Lord. Real relationship with the Lord. As we're told in the scripture as well, it's not the multitude of horses and chariots and things like that that protects or defends a nation. It's not how many missiles, rockets, aircraft carriers, security systems you have that protects a nation, but it's your relationship with God. As it's often questioned about 9-11, where was God? That on September 11th. Well, kind of ask the question, well, it's kind of funny you ask, you ask that question now, but not before. As far as where are you at in your relationship with the Lord? And I just think God simply took his hand of protection off because America is living in idolatry. And then we see with Jeroboam coming along, he was over the laborers in, from um, oh, what is he? Slip my mind. Tribe. Ephraim. Yeah, he was from Ephraim. And so he was over the laborers and this prophet named Ahijah comes up to him and tells him that he would be, he would give him the rule over uh, 10 of the tribes. So God gives him this opportunity to do things right. But he thought a couple of things in the wrong way. He thought he could be casual about his relationship with the law and the law of the Lord and simply give him lip service. And that never worked. And we'll see in chapter, chap, chapter uh, 12 how that continues to play out. Now, in the last verses of chapter 11, we see that Solomon dies as it says, now the rest of the acts of Solomon, verse 41, all that he did and his, and his wisdom are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? And the period that Solomon reigned in Jerus Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. Then Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father, and Rehoboam, his son, 
reigned in his place. Interesting thing about Rehoboam, you know, they, uh, excuse me, Solomon had all of those wives and concubines, but Rehoboam the, is the only child that's mentioned of Solomon. So I, I don't know why. Where are all these other people? But he's the only one that's mentioned. I guess the only one that's pertinent to the story. So in chapter 12, after Solomon's death, Rehoboam went to Shechem for all, it, all of Israel had gathered together at Shechem to make him king. So it happened when, uh, in verse 2, as it says, so it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it, he was still in Egypt because he ran away from Solomon to Egypt when, after Solomon found out about the prophecy that he was given. Um, for he had fled the presence of the king and had been dwelling in Egypt that they sent and called him, calling Jeroboam to come back. The people of Israel called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father. And his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. So he said to them, depart for three days and come back to me. And the people departed. He probably wanted three days because he needed to go back to Jerusalem to confer with the elders there. It was about a 12-hour walking trip from between Jerusalem and Shechem. And so that would give him a day to travel back, a day to confer with elders, and then a day to return. Now, it's interesting to note that none of these demands were spiritual demands. It's not saying, Rehoboam, if you follow the Lord, we'll follow you. They didn't say that. They said, oh, if you remove our burden. Now, it was really a legitimate request because the nation had been greatly taxed, even physically, you know, of building this temple, building all of the house, building all these different projects for Solomon. And they just got to the point where, okay, this is enough. This is enough. So he first talks to the elders, the older guys who served his father Solomon, and he says, well, here's their demand. What do you think? And they said, what they're saying is right. If you will serve them in this, in this way, they will continue to serve you. But then, he didn't like that. Didn't really like that advice. And it's kind of like someone who shops around for advice. You ever know people like that? They ask your opinion and then they say, oh, and you give your opinion. And then they walk away and like, they go ask somebody else because they didn't like your opinion. Well, that's kind of like Rehoboam here. He didn't like the advice given to the elders, given from the elders, so he asked his friends. And you have to know you're going to get a wrong answer from these types of friends. They're not, they're not the ones who will, the kind that will tell you the truth, but just seek to butter you up and, you know, encourage you in your position. So he goes and asks them, and they say, here's, here's what you need to tell the people. Tell them my little finger is going to be thicker than my father's thigh. It's, like, it's bigger than his waist. That, that, you know, he's going to come across, he whipped you with whips, I'll whip you with scourges. And just really in, in being abusive, verbally abusive to the people. And 
in this because he did this because that's what he told the people as he returned. He destroyed the authority that he had in just a few words. Now he no longer had authority over these people because they didn't they weren't going to submit to his authority when they saw that he didn't have their best interest at heart. But here as well, we see the demonstration of the sovereignty of God and the free will of man with, with first of all, God had prophesied to Jeroboam through Ahijah that he was going to have those 10 tribes. And then now we see it being played out and the circumstances being played out. God perfectly well knew ahead of time what was going to happen and he knew what Rehoboam's heart was like. God did not force Rehoboam against his will to make this decision. God knew he was going to make that decision. God is so sovereign that he has room within his sovereignty to, to allow for free will. And that's a real mind blower. So, all these people, then the people say in verse 16, what share have we with David? We in David, we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to your own house, O David. So Israel departed to their tents. So it says then, but Rehoboam reigned over the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of Judah. Then Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was in charge of the revenue. He's the tax guy, the internal revenue service guy. But all Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Therefore, King Rehoboam mounted his chariot in haste to flee to Jerusalem. So he was out there with his tax collector. He tried to go into the north with his tax collector and the people stoned him to death. So he gets ready. He's going to mount an army to go and attack the north. And bring them back under himself. But as it says in verse 22, but the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, to all the house of Judah and Benjamin and the rest of the people, saying, thus says the Lord, you shall not go nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Let Every man returned to his house, for this thing is from me. Therefore, they obeyed the word of the Lord and turned back according to the word of the Lord. So God specifically told them, stop, end it right here. This is from me. This is, and he's telling them, it's like when, when they go into, they're getting ready to go into Babylon later in the time of Jeremiah. When there, the message of Jeremiah was to submit to the Babylonians. You've reached the point of judgment here, so it's time to surrender to them, to serve them. And he even got to the point where they were accusing Jeremiah of working with the Babylonians. But he was simply saying, hey, God's pronounced judgment. Um, Accept it and go forward. And that's what he's telling them here in this situation. 
Now we see something interesting here in the rest of this chapter, verses 25 through 33 with Rehoboam. Remember, God had prophesied, had promised if he would follow him as David followed him, that he would be secure, that he would give him those 10 tribes as, and to him in his posterity. But that wasn't good enough for Rehoboam. Because remember, they had the feasts. They had the Day of Atonement. They had these times, remember the three feasts out of the year where all the adult Jewish men were required to go to Jerusalem to sacrifice, to worship the Lord. So Jeroboam thinking, in reasoning in his own mind, in his own heart, would said, this isn't good. If all these people keep going to Jerusalem, their heart's going to return to Rehoboam and they're going to want to reunite with him. And then what's going to happen to me? So he kind of acted sort of like later Constantine would in respect to the church where he combined some he combined pagan worship with the worship of the Lord and so you want to show that picture of the altar other picture yeah you're, as soon as you get it up there. But so what he did was he made two altars, one in Bethel and one in Dan, the, Dan in the north section of Israel and Bethel in the southern part of his, and they made a golden calf and put it on that place. This is in what place called Tel Dan now, Dan, the Tel just meaning it was a mound before that, before they dug it up. And that aluminum frame you see up there is what the altar was like before. And these stones around it were the foundation stones of that altar. And on top of that altar stood a golden calf one of the two golden calves that he made and he declared to the people, the, these are, this is the God that led you out of Egypt. And they were to worship that God. You see, he's making a political decision and he's offering these people easy religion. It's not inconvenient. You don't have to go all the way to Jerusalem. Just worship your God here. This is your God. And so he then um, furthers the idolatry in Israel. He didn't trust God's word to him, but took counsel within himself. And this is such a dangerous position to be in, but really a position that often is taken in the church today. We don't know how, you know, we can't reach these people out here without some type of compromise. We can't reach this nation, this world without becoming like them. We're told over and over again. But we see through these examples in the scripture, as we're told that all these things were done for our example, upon the, being those who upon the ends of the age has come. And so that's the position we are. We need to learn from these examples, see how that worked out for them. And not be foolish to re repeat the same mistakes. But when you have churches that are not teaching through the word, they don't get this. When they're just taught happy messages. How to prosper, how to be happy, how to have a good self-image. 
when you're taught those things, you can't really approach life the way God intended. And so, next time, we'll see how God confronts and deals with Jeroboam. Jeroboam was the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel. Now have Israel and Judah, two separate kingdoms. There was no, there were no good kings of the northern kingdom of Israel. All of them were into idolatry. And God ultimately judges them with the Assyrians before, over a hundred years before he judges the people of Judah. So, we see a lot of real warnings in here this evening. We see the warnings not to compromise your relationship with the Lord. We see the warning not to seek to work even the purposes of God out on your own. but to walk in relationship with him and depending upon him and trusting in him, trusting in his promises. He said it, he will do it. And that's what, you know, we take from, you know, what, it's wild, so wild to me because Solomon there, when he's dedicating the temple, said all the right things. Said all the right things. God made these promises. God kept these promises. God's going to bless you with these promises if you'll obey, if you'll continue to walk with him. But so quickly, he himself walked away from the Lord. And he actually died at a younger age than his father did. David died at 70. Solomon died at the age of 60. Probably pretty much burnt out. But we do see in Ecclesiastes, he got to the point in his later life where he learned all of these hard lessons. You know, you can learn lessons either the easy way or the hard way. And he chose the hard way. And at the end of Ecclesiastes, as he's talking about everything being vanity, wisdom, wealth, all of these things being vain, he comes to the conclusion at the end of Ecclesiastes and says, it's all vain except the fear of the Lord. That's the only thing that matters. That's the only thing you can hold on to is your relationship with the Lord. Everything else can crumble and fall. It doesn't last. So it makes no sense to hold on to things tightly because sooner or later, they're going to be gone. And when each of us is laying on our deathbed, it's just going to be you and the Lord. And the question is, are you going to have a relationship with him there he, so that he welcomes you into his kingdom? And you just, in that transition, you just feel the comfort of Christ. I love to hear the testimonies of believers who, who go to be with the Lord. As people are surrounding him, whether it's a father or a friend, whoever, people are surrounding them as they're on that, their deathbed and going to be with the Lord. And there's just that sense of peace and joy even in the midst of that. But Solomon, he reached the point where he felt that his life was vain because he focused on all the wrong things. We need to be careful 
not to repeat his mistake as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Yes, a warning, a challenge, but also an encouragement. Lord, that as we walk with you, as we abide in you, Lord, you give us so many promises that we might, as your word says, obtain the divine nature or become more like Jesus. And that's our goal, Lord, to be more like you and to follow you and to walk in obedience to you, knowing that you have the best. And if there's something we're asking for, Lord, at any time that isn't the best for us, Lord, feel perfectly free not to answer that. But Lord, may we trust in you with every areas of our lives, knowing that you didn't withhold your own son, but gave him up for us all. How should you not also with him freely give us all things? So we thank you for that, Lord, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.